This morning we have the absolute privilege, say absolute privilege, that's the best way I get to introduce whoever's speaking this morning, it is Shailene. Shailene, can you please come to the front and can you guys stand and give her a massive welcome to the front. Yeah, bless you. I'm going to be staring up my nostrils, Dan. <laughs> Good morning. It's a privilege to be together. And it's ironic that the last slide is about connect groups. We are headed in that direction this morning. Okay. So it's a privilege to laugh together, but it's a privilege to cry together. It's a privilege to worship together. And in aid of that, the name of my message this morning is Shaping Community. And whether that means to be shaped by community or whether to shape community or self, both definitions would apply. Okay, so when I say the word community, what kinds of things come to mind? Um, maybe it's the groups you're part of. So, for example, you're part of a club, or you do line dancing, or you meet with pastors, or whatever it is. You belong to communities, but you certainly belong to a family, right? What about um, other words that mean the same thing? So we say family. What about culture? What about nation? Nation, right? Na nation? No, nation. What about bringing it closer to home? Church? It's a community. Congregation? Tribe? And there's a lot of words you can find, right? But then certainly some scriptures might pop to mind. So throw up your hand. I want some audience participation. Throw up your hand if you've ever heard something like this in scripture, right? Um, do not neglect gathering of the saints. Have you heard that, right? <laughs> 10 points if you can tell me where it is, okay? <laughs> That's Hebrews 10, okay. What about, um, they will recognize us by our love for one another. Hmm? We've heard that one. That one is, a, that's part of that, exactly. <laughs> John chapter 13. And what about, we are the members of a body, many members with one head. That's what KG spoke about last time he preached. Yeah, and then what about the people shared everything and none had lack? Hmm? Church in Acts? Church in Acts much? Okay. Then we've got something that Hendrik brought up in prayer this morning. God commands his blessing when brothers dwell together in unity. Heard of that? Yeah, I'm not seeing any hands, but it's fine. I'm just hearing a lot of yes. Yes is good. Psalm 133, but there are many more. Uh, the word, this is the truth about the scriptures. That from cover to cover, they are a unified text, and they consistently prove themselves over and over and over again. And if I had to go there, we would be here all day. Actually, probably till next week. Okay, but now, I don't know if anybody knows me. I like a bit of an Oxford Dictionary definition. But my favorite one I'm only going to draw from this morning is that Oxford actually says, a community is a group of people practicing common ownership. Isn't that the coolest thing in the world? It's like scripted in the dictionary, sans the Bible, okay? A group of people practicing common ownership. There are obviously a lot of other definitions, amongst which is an identity. A community is an identity. But today the word community is all I want to use to reference us as a body, this particular body. If we can go here this morning, I realize there's only a certain representation of us here this morning, but we're a bigger community than this. If everyone had to show up, we'd cover it from wall to wall nearly, right, with all of our kids, and that's a privilege. So for those of us who arrived this morning, be blessed in the hearing of the word. My heart um, for this message is to draw a picture of how God intended our togetherness to shape us. And when I say that, I mean genuinely his intention was that our being together would show us who he is. Okay, so now, this is not news to any of you. but <laughs> We're going to learn about it in a slightly different lens this morning. So my favorite scripture recently that's been revamping my heart about it comes from Acts chapter 17. I'm not going to read it to you. I'd love you to go look it up yourself and meditate because actually the translations are vastly different. But Acts chapter 17 verse 25 and 26 will tell you, there you will discover that God created us various races and it draws on our ethnicity in order that we would long for him and find him. And then it, it, knocks, that, it knocks it with a final statement over the, the six. It gives us a six, and it says um, that so that um, because he is the God who is easy to find, so he's made us many races in order that we would long for him and find him because he is easy to find. How cool is that? Let me take a breath. Okay. 
Have you noticed, though, when you lump a group of people together in a group, some awkward, unmentionable things tend to begin to happen. I'm just going to, there's a giant elephant in every room. And I'm going to shine a spotlight on that thing because it's unnecessary. I want to show you how things like disappointment, misunderstanding, okay, conflict, what about failure? And the fifth one I'd like to mention is disagreement. How those things can leave us feeling like something's wrong in a community. Have you ever felt that? Get into a space, and the longer you're there, the more used to that feeling you get. But in a family, you don't have the privilege of walking away. <laughs> you're just stuck with what you got. But in a community like this, you have a choice. You can literally walk away. You could go choose another community. And there you will find another of the five or add to that list. Or we could see it in a different light, and that's what I want to shine a light on this morning. Okay, so my hope is that we'll begin to see those five specific things, although I won't go there again. We're going to shine light on light this morning. But how those five specific things can become opportunities. Okay, See them as doors, access points, through which the Lord wants to reveal more of his nature to us. Because that's what he said. The Acts 17 scripture says, we are made different groups or communities so that we would long for him and not walk off in the desert again and then find him in said community because he wants to be found. Okay, my phone's timing out. I wish I could walk around holding my phone. It's very unprofessional, but I'm going to put it down. Okay, we would all love that. The treasure inside of us to be unpacked. Isn't that kind of what we desire? We're so excited when somebody else takes off, and sometimes we're less excited when somebody else takes off and we haven't. Those are all markers of what community does to our heart, right? Okay. This morning, I hope we'll begin to see that we can extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy because two things. Our weapons are not carnal, and they are against humans, definitely. Our weapons are for killing humans, right? Right? Zero. We do not war against each other. We war against higher, or different authorities. I won't call them higher. I'll call them noisy. How about that? Things that are distractions from what the actual purpose is of a gathering like this. And it's interesting we should draw from worship. To, you know, to preach straight after the worship is quite a privilege because that led us straight into the throne room. And he was speak, we were hearing and, and testifying of the love of God and the closeness we have with him. But we were not singing about how happy we are that our brother's sitting next to us. We just happen to be lumped in this particular group this morning. But yet he's drawn us to his heart communally. So what we get to do is leave from Monday to Saturday and think that we simply come to church to receive things from the throne. But we, we don't just come for that. We are a representation of the throne. We don't just meet with some far-off God. We meet with each other to find him. Um, again, I know it's not new to you, but I'm saying it in the hopes that it'll spark something in you this morning, or in me as well. This was something the Lord gave me a little while back for my own heart. Okay, so now as we take to the water, there are four questions I would like to walk through together with us. And if you would, why don't you jot them down? or keep a note for somewhere for later, like your Acts 17 scripture. Jot down the four questions. So you can take this to any context of a community you might belong in, whether it's your family. But let's deal with it this morning over here, just particular to this church we've chosen. Okay, first question. Do I love this community? You're going to personalize it. It's for you. Do I love this community? As much as it's for me as well. When I say you, I mean us, the collective. Okay. Second question, do I bring myself fully to this community? Okay. Do I bring myself in my entirety to this community? Number three, do people really know me in this body? Does somebody here know exactly who I am? Okay. And then the fourth one, big question. Is this community safe in my hands? Okay. If you got those down. Like I said earlier, the Bible is connected from top to tail. We've known this. The more you read scripture, the more you see it. Every 
apparent conflict is in fact opposite sides of the same coin. God is never in conflict with himself. He's just so manifold and multi-layered that if we look at one thing, we think the other one doesn't exist, but yet he doesn't work like that. In Hebrew and ancient texts, they, they write from, and I'm, tell me if I'm wrong, mom, those with a, de- a degree in Hebrew will say they write beginning, middle, beginning. So in the Western world, we write a story from the beginning. We flesh out the body. In fact, we do the body first, then we write the beginning, and then we finish it with a conclusion that reminds us what we were thinking then. But that's actually not how the Bible's written. The ancient texts were written from the beginning, giving you the whole flesh and coming back to what was most important and said first, hence the law of first mention. So let's go back to question one. I hope that your heart has clarity as we walk through these things. There isn't going to be a lot of flesh around each question. We're going to touch on it, and then in the end, we'll draw an umbrella over all of it. Okay. Question one, do I love this community? In answering this question, a lot of us might be tempted to say a particular behavior looks like love. So I should be doing this if I love. In the context of a marriage, what is that to you? If your wife's love language is acts of service, you're going to be washing the dishes for her on her birthday or whatever it is. You know, in a community context, if this church really values missions, we are all going to see love as going across the street to the next house and sharing the gospel. But there's many ways to see love. Particularly this morning, I'd like to reframe it as 1 John 4 shows us. So I'm reading from the passion for this particular one, not for all of them. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7 says, Those who are loved by God, let his love continually pour from you, because God is love. Everyone who loves is fathered by God and experiences an intimate knowledge of him. Then verse 12, No one has ever gazed upon the fullness of his splendor. But if we love one another... God makes his permanent home in us, and we make our permanent home in him, and his love is brought to its full expression in us. Did you hear that? Wild. I heard that deep down. Okay. If we learn from that, it seems that the mark of a person who loves, when we're talking about verbs here, someone who actually doingly loves, is that they are first loved. Nay. We cannot give what we don't have, right? Let me not skip to another note. Okay, so firstly, be loved by him. But in, this, in the middle of this verse, I'd like to draw from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just one verse. Verse 16 commands us to regard nobody according to the flesh, right? Then you skip a book, a couple of books, and you get to Galatians, where it tells us... Um, Hang on, not Galatians yet. That's a little bit further on. We're skipping a little further on to verse 19, and we are entrusted with the message of reconciliation. So we go from, let's get this picture, question one. You are loved by your father. Then what happens with that love is you give it. And then what he does is he responds to your giving of love. And then he comes inside here. You open the door of your heart. He comes in and he lays out the most perfect furnishing of an apartment ever, ever attractive to a person. Then you secretly close the door because you know what happened inside. And all of a sudden you become a magnet. People start being drawn to you. They look in your eyes. They see the way he furnished the inside of your house. And then they're restored. Reconciliation begins to happen, even though it's not instant. What they see inside your face is what he intended to be there. It's not something you manufactured. It's because you were found in love, right? So when God lays out the inside of your heart, surely there's an appointment for everyone who comes to you by his appointment because he wants to reconcile them back to himself and back to each other and back to destiny. This has such a magnificent knock-on effect. My loving this community, the only responsibility I have is to be loved by my father. Because when I see him, <laughs> I, can prevent, I can prevent whatever I like in my own strength. But when I've seen him, I will drop everything that hinders because nothing else makes sense. Okay. Quickly see there. Step two. Do I bring myself fully to this community? Super practical question. It's a special one for me because um, I don't know if who's ever heard of a Gallup or a Clifton Strength Finders test. 
Have you ever heard of it? Okay, like four people, great. Okay, there are a ton of ways to determine your strengths in the world. And for me, on this particular thing, my third strength is individualization. So when you hear that word, you think, oh, yeah, you don't like authority, zero. I thoroughly believe in the concept of order, but what I wanna see is you be you, and you be you, and you be you, and nobody mimic anybody else, right? So this is a particularly helpful one for me. But here's the thing. Inside each of our hearts is a burning desire to add value. Am I wrong? You don't wake up in the morning and think, I wonder how I can waste my life. You literally desire deeply to be meaningful. And that's because God put his stamp of his nature on you. When he made you, he designed you to want to create. He designed you to want to bring order. He designed you to want to give yourself fully to something. And that's not wrong. So a community is supposed to be a place where that can in fact take place. Let's couple our desire to add value with a little bit more scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, in a lot of, let's just lump that text together, one chapter, reminds us to bring our gifts in order to edify the body. Something sensitive. You walk in the door, you have a desire to see something change. A couple of things can happen. There could be a fence in your heart. Why is it not like this? Walk out the door. Okay? Or... You can come in and say, I wonder if I can change that. And you run roughshod over the system and immediately bombastically put your opinion down. Not likely either of us. What we generally do is we come, we look at it for a while, a couple of months, wondering why it's not working. Eventually get a bit disgruntled and start worshipping only the throne, not with the people. And we miss a large gift. But what if you could come not comparing yourself to anybody else, which is what we see in Galatians, okay? <laughs> That's what I was trying to get to. And then, you also remember from what KG drew from, 1 Corinthians 12, saying to us, we are different gifts to the body. Not one was meant to be the same. And even though amongst, what is it, Romans chapter 4, no, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12, they all speak about gifts. If you had to sum those up in around 19 of them, you would think, sure, that's pretty limited. I'm sure the body of Christ has many more gifts than just 19. But the thing is, it's multiplied by your understanding of him. If you've been fathered and you are loved and you open the door of your heart and he manifests himself in your lounge, guarantee if you open my lounge, it's very different. Open Uncle Tinas' lounge, very different. Right, but we weren't meant to look the same. We're not meant to keep up with the Joneses. We're meant to bring our part of the body together. And this is something, I, I just picture this. Imagine your head without an inner ear. I wouldn't be able to know, it's not there. What would happen to you if you didn't have an inner ear? You'd be completely off balance, right? But no one would know. <laughs> it's just a missing part of the body. That's what happens to this body when you remove yourself. I say you. When any one of us chooses to pull out, the body gets off balance. Change body part. What if it was a liver, right? Without your liver, nobody would see. Eventually, you'd turn yellow. But still, it's not really something you see. It's an eventual outworking of a missing part. We need every one of us. 100% non-comparative, bringing ourselves to edify the body so that this whole thing can function. And it's not because there's a tick list on the wall that says, Yongama arrived or didn't arrive this morning, right? Mm -hmm. The tea was packed out in straight cup. No one cares about that stuff, I promise, especially not in this house. What they do care about, though, what we care about collectively is that we flourish that each of us would flourish, because if you plant it in the house of the Lord, you are like a tree planted next to waters that feeds many for generations to come. We spoke about bread last time. That's the only reference that ties to bread. And Tinas was asking, are you preaching about bread again? I said, no. <laughs> okay. We will very quickly take strain if we try to do something we were not designed for. I'm going to share a small testimony and give it 20 seconds about something. I was in a fantastic community in another part of South Africa for seven years. I was on team for three and a half of those years. And I loved it. I was drawn out relationally very, very deeply. It was beautiful. But there were a few boxes you had to tick. And what we learned there is that when there's a gap, you fill it. It's not a healthy way to see the kingdom. Jesus is the gap filler. And if a gap needs to hover a little bit so that the ground, which appears to be fallow, can just lie, 
so that the next harvest can come, then that's fine. You do not need to fill a space because there is one. You need to fill a space because he said, this is where you go. Okay, this is the way. Walk in it. All right. Question three. Do people really know me in this community? Okay, another practical thing. My guess is that many of us have walked into this room at one stage or another guarded or holding back. Because we don't really want to share it, sometimes to me, if I don't want to share something because I don't want to talk today, that's just how I feel, okay? We very all feel, we'll say, we do things by the feeling. And then the other thing is, you don't want to be a burden. The majority of you are much nicer than me, you walk in the door and you just don't want to burden anybody, so I'm fine, I'm fine, we've said it enough now. Or you feel like your problem's been going on for enough years, don't need to talk about that. Am I wrong? Right, I hope you're mostly, mostly really healthy in that way. But there's another thing that could happen. Maybe you've regretted oversharing in the past. Possibly been a little vulnerable, and it bit you. Hey, we're all real, all humans. At least in some community somewhere, you wish you didn't say something to someone. Okay. But the reality is we all do need somebody. The truth is we can't all know each other deeply. You will have your family that knows you. You'll have your spouse. But outside of those relationships. You need at least one friend who loves Jesus more than they love you. So that when you walk in the door and you smile, they're gonna see past your smile and text you later. They're not gonna attack you right here so everybody knows they're compassionate. They'll let you go because they know how you function and later they'll get hold of you and they'll say, hey, which part of the road did you forget about? Let's come back. And they're not gonna say to you why this is the body that's hurt you. You should get out. It's not that friend. No, 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 that's not a friend. A soul friend is somebody who looks into his eyes, knows what you're called to, and draws you back to that line. And that's what we need here, right? So are you a friend like that to somebody yourself? Okay? It's a short thing, but it's an important thing. Because we've seen how we get lonely. Then we come and we sit and we sing, only to the throne, and we ignore each other because we hurt. Okay. Okay. Proverbs 27 is a good book for this. Um, And in two verses, it speaks in verse 6, about trusting the wounds of a friend, okay? You can trust a friend who wounds you with honesty. Then it goes on to speak about the fool. But did you hear that? You can trust a friend who wounds you with honesty. Same chapter, a little further down. I'm reading this from the Passion because it's just too cool. It says, a grinding wheel to sharpen a blade. And so one person sharpens another. So if you if you truly believe that you've been given, um, let's call it co uh, co inheritance with Christ. So you're seated next to him. I don't know a king who was just born into it. Yes, sure, inheritance. You inherit the title, but to become one means walking in the footsteps of your father. To become a priest means, which is what we've been given, is to walk sacrificially, lay down all else in terms of worship, and pick up a role. But that takes a lifetime. So a human being can't be a very easy thing to shape. We're not bonsais. You can't just plant us in a pot and keep us small and keep it pretty and it's going to be healthy. You can do that to a person, but there will be no health. There won't be fruit. There won't be life. There won't be generations to come, right? So who wouldn't want that pain (laughs) <laughs> that's what someone I follow um, says, calls productive pain. This is a grinding stone and you're on it, similar to bread. You get pulverized into shape. And it's not because God is cruel, it's because you deserve it. Did you know that if a muscle is going to grow, a couple of things will happen. You have to pick up things that are too heavy, okay, if you want it to be strengthened. And you have to pick up things slightly too heavy a lot of times if you want it to get toned. And then you also have to roll it out. And then you get stronger. That's what a community does. So if you come with a wound, or totally happy, whatever it is, you come sit here, and you ignore the fact that there's people around you, you're ignoring the fact that you need shaping, or me, we need shaping. Trust me, this girl needs shaping. It's happened, it happens all the time. I'm in constant process. And that's the reason I can be vulnerable about it, because there's only ever one way I've learned, and that's through pain. Unfortunately, it's not God's design for us. It's because I'm stubborn. I want me some hard lumps that need to be rubbed off. And God knows that. But he made me like him. Right? So which part of you are him? Are you, which part of him are you like? Which part of you is hard to shape? 
You know, that's the kind of stuff that it's putty in his hands because you know what it is? He's a potter and he's a goldsmith and he values deeply the material in his hands and he knows how to work it to make a shape. You know, we've all heard a preach about a potter somewhere along the line, right? You know about this. But if you remember today that we are shaping each other by his merciful hand, then you will value it differently. When next time you come back, you'll see that pain as a, not pain, it's not a very fun descriptor, this grinding wheel. But you can see how we fall over the stumbling blocks here in community of those five things we mentioned earlier. Disappointment, a misunderstanding, conflict, failure. And what was the other one? Disagreement. What if those things were the tools that the Lord was using to shape us on his wheel? How can they not be? You have the opportunity when you walk in the door to have things exactly as you'd like them, or you have the opportunity to face a disagreement with someone and go, okay, it's a standoff, or okay, no, wait, we can dance. Let me see your perspective. Let me see what God says through your eyes, right? How cool a shaping tool is that? Let's take encouragement here from uh, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9 from the New American Standard, not not passion this time. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. I'm going to read that again. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Seems a bit of an oxymoron. It's not. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Imagine if all of us did that. We woke up in the morning and we decided, yo, I really am bad at patience. Okay, I'm coming to church. Somebody going to help me with that? I'm really bad at patience. Give me something that can help me work that. Imagine if we saw it like that and not as a precluder that God is saying, oh, yo, you struggled in that area. Mm -mm. Let's wait another year. I'm going to sideline you, we're going over here. God doesn't do that. If you're loved by a loving father, step one, do I love this community? If you're loved by him, then you trust him. I don't know, anybody fathering wounds much? We've all, we've all had that, okay? Not really perfect earth daddies, but we know that. He is the perfect daddy. So we've got to get through that stuff and see that when he fathers us, he's, he's inviting us further. He's saying, don't worry, I'm happy to make my lounge inside of you even if you're not perfect. And people will come and they'll see parts of me and as you mature, they'll see more of me. And then we reconcile people to destiny. And then on top of that, what was that other question? Uh, community fully, right? Okay, then you give of your gifts in a vulnerable place. You bring all of who you are without comparing yourself to the next person. And then everything you do edifies the body, even though you make a mistake, and we've done it. Guys, I'm a grammar Nazi. Spelling mistakes on the slide irritate me. They do, a lot. But that's okay, because I love people, like a lot. So I know what, is, what they're trying to say. Let's not, let's not let small things create obstacles, right? Because it's silly how, how quickly we create an obstacle so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. <laughs> Number four, is this community safe in my hands? And this is where we're landing. It's a delicate question, I know, but the heart of it is to highlight honor as a high value of community. Not just honoring the Father, honoring each other. Okay. Because it is a tool that diffuses the fiery arrows of the enemy. Honor goes like this, lekker, <laughs> folnido, so that that arrow doesn't land where it was intended, or even better, you turn it around and you throw it back at him. Can you imagine? You start weaponizing those things. Disappointment becomes a weapon, is it? Is it? Goitrig. Because I'm not going to let it land in my heart because I know who I am because there's already a lounge in here fully furnished. You can have that back. And in fact, before I can do that, because we're not all there yet, we do not all know how to turn the enemy's weapons against him. But if that's, if at the very least, don't believe it. Don't let it inside your house, right? Don't let it light ablaze that perfect lounge. Okay, how we keep this community safe is that. Because if each of us, you better believe, we are all receiving a thousand onslaughts a day from that enemy. 
And if you've trained your ear to listen to those things and you've trained your eye to see those things coming, one of two things can happen. Either it becomes your whole world. You become totally demon-focused and everything's a problem. Okay? There's a potential fire around every corner. But the problem is then you won't come in the door because you'll be afraid to bring your fire with you. And that's not really the way to see it. The way to see it is, no, no, no. I am completely safe, seated next to Christ. Ain't nothing going to land on me. So it's not going to land on you either. I'm going to come in here, say cheers, not welcome, and protect this community by not bringing it with me. Mm. Okay. Galatians chapter 5. Uh, hang on a second. Yes. Verse 25 and 26. New Living Translation. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Verse 26. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. 1 Peter 2 says of honoring in verse 17, recognize the value of every person continually showing love to every believer. Live your lives with great reverence and in holy awe of the Lord. We know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Let me read that verse together. Again, recognize the value in each person. That means you don't assign a value they don't have. You recognize what God put there intrinsically, whether it bugs you or not. Okay? You live your lives with great rev. We live our lives with great reverence. Go back a few verses to the previous scripture. We're not jealous of one another. We're not conceited. And we, that means proud, secretly thinking more highly of ourselves than we would, we ought to, and we don't provoke one another. Those are very practical things. They're not like for unbelievers. They're for, they're for us, because this is the stuff that crops up in our hearts. I'm being honest. This is my life, right? Well, not currently. Thank God for some of those things. But they are, there's, there's truth to that honor being a fiery dot that can, or a squasher of fiery dots. So when I choose to honor another human, whether I feel that I'm slightly better at it than them, I afford them honor, and that diffuses me, and I get humble. <laughs> humble to the point of doing nothing and letting them shine, right? What if I'm jealous? I've been working 25 years in one area. Somebody else suddenly steps in three months in, and they are polished at it. It looks, you don't know the backstory, but there's a jealousy that creeps up, right? Honor. Squash the arrow. Put it down. I choose your timing, Father, because you're the author and perfecter of my faith. Imagine, we can weaponize all those things, turn them back on the enemy. Because what he wants technically is disunity. He wants us to fall apart at the seams, doesn't he? Surely that starts in small ways. You can hack at a giant, you can take a cow, kill it, and then just like hack at the back. And that won't really help you. <laughs> you need to slowly take it apart. Skin off, in the joints. That's how you work into a community, slowly. He's trying desperately to get in in all those little ways, but he can't. If you squash the fire by knowing the truth, the arrow can land nowhere, and then the rest of us are safe. Okay. So let's recap. Weaving the path together. Number one, love. You receive. You give. He comes in. Then people come they become reconciled. Step two, you give yourself. Bring who you are completely to edify the body. Don't compare. Each role is vital. Functioning as a whole requires you. Step three, be known. Find one friend who loves Jesus more than you. Join a connect group, right? Or start a connect group. Then let down your guard so that you can be sharpened and his power can work through you. Step four, become a protector. So live in the fear of the Lord. Honor one another more highly than yourself, than ourselves. Show love. Always being led by the Spirit, because he'll tell you. Led by the Spirit, so that we can truly aim where he is aiming. And that the most important part is that his glory can be made manifest amongst us because I see him when I look at you. And when I look at you, and when I look at you, that that I see behind your eyes, he put there. 
and it better make me tremble. That will give me wisdom. If I recognize in the fear of the Lord, it's wise to see him in you, I will take traction. Suddenly, ground is gained in my own life and then in my kids' lives. And suddenly, my body is growing because I am. Come on. It's an unstoppable chain reaction. Okay. So, if I may, Dan, to pray. I have a strong conviction about what to pray for this morning. I'm going to slow down. I have a strong sense that there's freedom, freedom to be had this morning. But it's quite specific. I'd like to pray over us, and specifically because we can get focused on one particular negative encounter, and it can get us stuck in a hole. And that hole can become bitterness. Okay, the friends of bitterness, resentment, Disappointment, disillusionment, accusation. Okay, so if I'm speaking and the Holy Spirit's highlighting any of those words to you, and you feel you'd like to be free this morning, completely free from any of those things, I'd like you to open, stand up for me or with me and open up your hands because we're going to do two things. We're going to release it and we're going to receive something else in exchange. So I know it's vulnerable, I understand. But if anybody has any inkling of any of those things being meaningful in your heart, please, would you mind standing with me? Yeah, that's a good one. Definitely not just in the church context, anywhere in your life. (laughs) Anywhere in your life, whether it's family, whether it's something that happened a long time ago in another body. Anything at all, not just here, because we're actually wonderful in this place. (laughs) Okay. I'm going to get very serious now. Please repeat after me. Heavenly Father, you don't have to be loud. I forgive the person or the people that I've held captive for their perceived wrongs, and I repent for holding them. I renounce bitterness in all its forms, in Jesus' name. Thank you that I am forgiven, and as I release them, I am freed. Okay, now you just remain in a posture of receiving. I'm going to pray over you. If anybody around them feels the need to lay hands, please go wild. This is um, an intense time. Father, I bind the strong man of bitterness in this place right now in the name of Jesus. We bind disorder, we bind disillusionment, and we bind the perpetual pain associated with bitterness. But we loose in the name of Jesus right alignment right now into every life. We we release hope in Jesus' name and freedom in this place once and for all. God, thank you that your blood has long since sealed this work, Jesus. You knew it when you went to the cross, you dealt with it. And Holy Spirit, would you rush in? And I see a picture of his water and his wind together in one, rushing in and becoming a comforter, putting new breath into lungs, the freedom of lungs to actually breathe better this morning, Father. And holy fire, as he reignites your heart and your destiny to where he had intended for you to be in this moment, in Jesus' name. And we believe things will begin to move drastically in this body because of this appointment with your presence this morning. You are such a kind counselor, Lord. Thank you that you always knew this moment would come. You always prepared this encounter, and I thank you that you've already sealed it. Yeah, you are so good. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, okay. Heavenly Father, thank you for every man and woman that was here, stood up, didn't stand up. Thank you that we love this community. We love communities. We love our families. You're welcome to sit if you're uncomfortable. Thank you so much for your your moment on the 22nd of September, 2024, with our hearts that released us into a freedom to come for generations. And I pray that you'd bless everybody on their road home and on their next step with you. And most importantly, thank you that as you are as close as a brother and our closest friend, that friends would begin to come into lives where they haven't been before, Father. So the value of community can be seen by all. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Thank you so much, Celine. Yeah, just if there's a, if there's any doubt, the Lord says here. Yeah, he says he brought me forth into a large place. He was delivering me because he was pleased with me and delighted in me. And I want you to know God is pleased with you. And every single person, that's the starting place. As Shailene was saying, you need to open your heart to come and do that work in your heart so that he can furnish you beautifully. And I've found that a lot of people struggle with the revelation that God is pleased with them. That God loves them. And then the Lord says, unless the Lord builds the house, man builds in vain. And God builds the house. God builds the community. And he builds the house through his love, through bringing us into a large place. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to bring us into a large place through the revelation that God is pleased with us. Isn't that amazing? And then in Galatians 5, just at the end here, it says, Be mindful to be a blessing, especially to those of the household of faith. See with what large letters I'm writing this with my own hand. Be mindful to be a blessing. I want to bless this household this morning to experience God's love, His fullness, and rest. Take that victory this morning, that victory over bitterness. Take that, throw it away, throw the bitterness away, and dwell in the fact that God is pleased with you, because that takes all bitterness away. Bless you. May you have an incredible Sunday. Enjoy a cup of coffee, a cappuccino, an incredible brownie. And we look forward to seeing everyone next week. Bless you guys.